good afternoon and welcome to what you need to know about investing in startups. My name is Kevin Cadet and I'm the executive director of Black Angels Miami. Uh, don't worry, you are in the right place because I am joined by uh, Marlon Nichols. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us uh, during these crazy times and I hope you are safe and well. Um, before we jump in with Marlon, I want to very quickly introduce you to Black Angels Miami. Uh, you may have skipped the whole Black Angels Miami and saw Marlon's name and had to join, but for all those that aren't familiar with us, uh, we are a new and growing angel investment club. Our focus is to expose individuals to spectacular early stage companies with high growth potential. And our overall goal is really to diversify the landscape of angel investing. Um, which is essentially not very diverse. So as such, we seek members of all races, but we do proactively work on increase, increasing the participation of uh, black investors. Uh, so BAM itself is not a fund. Uh, we do not make investments ourselves, but our members do. And uh, we started actively in January. Great timing with what's happening right now. And we have an amazing board of Baron Chana, Kimberly Marshall, Charmel Maynard, and Dorothy Terrell. And I would be remiss if I did not highlight the Knight Foundation that has been an amazing sponsor of our organization. And if you want to learn anything more about Black Angels Miami, you can reach out to us or view everything on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter, Black Angels Miami. So Marlon, is a well-known early stage investor. Uh, you've all seen his bio in the invite, so I, I won't go deeply into that, but if you're here, you're here because you wanna hear what Marlon has to say. And um, one interesting thing, I am, if you hear an accent, I'm originally from England, and I just found out that Marlon played professional basketball in England, in London, my hometown, which blew my mind. Um, among other things, he's a Cornell graduate as I am, so it's all, all in all a great person. So Marlon, um, thank you for joining us. Let's dive right in. I'm going to hit you with a couple of quick warm-up questions. So what keeps you up at night, and it can include anything to do with COVID-19? <laughs> well, for, first of all, thanks for inviting me and having me on. Um, should be fun. It's a little strange, you know, talking uh, to a bunch of people and not being able to see the majority right. of them. Um, but um, you'll do for now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the conversation will be as good as you make it, man. So um, yeah. no, no, no pressure. Um, what, what keeps me up at night and not, not related to COVID? Um, no, it's just this constant push of, um, of trying to, to win and not, um, and not fail. And that could be, that could be anything. It's, it's my business. It's in, it's in family life. Um, you know, it's this new exercise regimen that I'm doing, trying to get back to, um, you know, shape as, as though I was 25 again. Um, this, just, con just meeting, meeting the goals that I set for myself. Um, and right now, I know you said not to mention COVID, but um, my attention is, a lot of my attention is going there uh, just because of all the companies that's um, within our portfolio and just thinking about the CEOs and all the people that work in those companies. Um, so, you know, it's just thinking how can we best support them so that as many of those people get to keep their, keep their jobs as possible while allowing the companies to, um, to succeed. So what motivates you in the morning? I guess you're ready covered that <laughs> when you wake up you got the same things on your mind right okay yeah man I'm, uh, i am a super competitive person so yeah um and i set i set a lot of a lot of um personal goals and that's usually what i'm thinking about in the morning what i what i want to achieve today and and how do i go about doing that all right so what makes you shake your head <laughs> I've got a couple of things which come up on a daily basis, which just makes me shake my head. Man, right, right now I'm watching the news and I'm looking at these protests about, um, you know, canceling these uh, shelter in place um, situations. And I'm just, I'm, I'm literally shaking my head. Like people are gathering in these big groups, basically touching each other and uh, in the midst of this pandemic. 
um, you know, and, and asking um, to, to relax, you know, these measures that are helping us to fight this thing. And it's just, it's just crazy how, um, how selfish people can be. And, um, and in some cases, just how ignorant um, people, people can be. Uh, so that is a huge, has been a huge disappointment to, to watch. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been bothering me. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about investing everyone's uh waiting for so you are the founding and managing partner of uh, mac investing mac capital ventures and uh venture capital and angel investing a lot of similarities you may be investing in the same company and at the same time and and there are some differences uh we have a lot of new investors in the audience Will you please highlight what makes angel investing unique? Yeah, it's, I mean, you, you touched on it, right? You typically investing uh, or either before or alongside um, institutional investors, which are what VCs or venture capitalists are. The only difference is um, when I do it, I'm investing out of a, out of a fund, which means I've raised capital from, high net worth individuals, family offices, um, fund of funds, pension funds, um, endowments, et cetera. And I'm managing that pool of capital and deploying or investing out of that pool of capital where it, as an angel investor, you're investing at your personal wealth, um, which gives you uh, more control, right? You only have yourself to answer to. I <laughs> have all these investors that I've made promises to um, about how we're going to allocate the capital um, that I have to um, to keep in mind, and then um, one really cool thing about being an angel investor is, you know, you can. Um, I have, for instance, um, in investment thresholds that that I'll make, right? So, we'll we typically deploy anywhere between half a million to 1.5 million um, at our first investment within a company, um, and we're looking to get 10% ownership within that company at that, at that stage. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of math that goes behind that because we're trying to return capital to our investors. Um, when, you, when you're investing for yourself, right, you don't have to worry about anyone else, right? You're looking for a multiple on just your money alone, right? Which puts you in the position to, you know, write a $100,000 check in a, you know, $50 million round, right? Where you own very little, but um, when that returns, you're getting, you're getting all of that profit. You're not having to share it with your partners or, um, or your limited partners. Gotcha. So with the state of the economy and everything that's happening in everyone's lives, is now a good time to be or become an angel investor? I say yes, right? Um, the it's it's being said a lot now, but I've believed it for a long time. Uh, some of the best times to um, deploy capital in venture and in private companies are you know during recessions and during economic downturns. Um, you know, Google, um, uh, Uber, um, a number of other companies have been were created and funded during the last two um, economic downturns downturns and look how they've, um, they performed. The thing is, you know, great companies are going to get funded in every environment because they're, because they're great companies. And so the thing about doing it in a, in a down, in a down swing is that the, the prices are more favorable to, um, to investors and the bar gets a little bit higher, right? And not as many, not as many um, people are, are investing as actively as they, it had been so there's there's less competition um which drives down depresses the prices a bit and you're getting more for your um for your money during this time and again um if a company is able is successful at raising capital during this time it means it likely means they have something they're um you know the fundamentals of the business are, are usually pretty sound so <clears throat> yeah i, I... I feel the same way as you. I know, you know, I've heard everything from the spectrum of, you know, I'm going to pour my money into the market. I'm going to put all my money into 
these opportunities, which are, are unique at this time, because this time's not coming, hopefully not coming back. Um, but as far as your investing thesis, has that changed in light of COVID-19? No, I, I think it's a mistake to kind of change what you were doing um, um, before. Um, it, it, that, I mean, that assumes that you were, <laughs> you were sticking to your fundamentals before, right? But if you were doing the right things before, you continue to do the right things now. The only shift in, you know, kind of in our thinking right now is, um, is a lot more focus on, on runway and, and, um, and burn, right? So um, the way that translates into the way we look at deals now is that you're, you're thinking about, you're looking at a company and you're thinking, all right, well, how much, how much are they raising, right? Is that enough to, um, to, to get them to you know, 12 to 24 months from now? Um, because we're not sure how um, you know, this pandemic is going to affect all businesses, you know, um, six months, twelve months down the down the road, and so you'd hate to invest in a company now and then have to bridge that company in in twelve months because they, they weren't able to um, they weren't able to either control their burn or uh, or generate um, revenue, which also um, extends their runway, decreases their um, their burn rate, and, and extends their runway. So, so you're looking at, you know, is, are they raising enough? Um, you're, you're looking at in this environment, do we believe that they can, um, they can close business and, and generate revenue? Uh, those, you know, in, in other days, you might give a company a pass on those things, right? If they're not, they hadn't started, um, you know, generating revenue yet uh, because you see it coming down, coming down the road. Um, and you know that, um, you know, the um, economic environment is, is one where it's not going to be difficult for them to raise additional, additional capital, you know, several months um, uh, down the road. So you're really, you're really laser focused on um, runway, um, the, in, the aggregate investment amount of, of the round that you're, you're participating in and, uh, and burn. So with that said, in the past, would you have possibly invested in a concept, someone who has not really made traction, but you feel strongly is a, a good venture? Yeah, so I'd never say never, <laughs> but we, we tend to, our sweet spot is um, seed stage. And for us, that means that the company has built a product. It's either, it could be, you know, as early days as an MVP, um, uh, about a viable product essentially. Um, and they're starting to, to get some feedback from the market, you know, for a consumer company, that means they might've done like a, a soft launch where they've only let a few, um, a, a few consumers in or given them access to the, to the platform. And we can see how they're acting um, with the platform. Or if it's an enterprise, you know, maybe they have one or two beta customers, and um, you know, we can have a conversation with those beta customers as to, you know, um, how they see this business um, and this relationship going forward. Is this something vital to, um, you know, to them, or is this uh, just something that they're they're testing out and um, it may not have legs? That's usually where where we invest. Now we've made exceptions where um, companies haven't launched yet, but in those cases, we know the, um, the founding team really, really well and probably have worked with them before and witnessed them executing you know, at, a, you know, at, a, at a high level um, in prior companies. And we feel more, more comfortable that they'll be able to, um, to, to pull it off. But um, typically, I don't think I've ever you know, invested in someone that came with a, you know, a, a notepad or a PowerPoint and said, this is is what we want to do. Give us some money to go to go and do it. Um, would like to see a little bit more skin in the game um, before you know before we deploy our capital. Because again, we have investors that um, you know we have a fiduciary responsibility to. Okay. Now, um, one thing you did say is that you for for the early you know 
minimal viable product, con- a little bit more than concept. You mentioned you knew the founders before. So today, it's significantly harder to get to know a founder because you can't meet them. So one, <laughs> are you looking at potential founders that you have not physically met? And do you believe that deals will be made with founders that physically have not met or don't have a relationship with the, with, with, with the, uh, the investors? Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm evaluating a deal right now uh, with a, a founder um, who I have not met in, in person. Um, fortunately, I, I know some of her, a couple of her um, prior investors um, who are providing, um, acting as, as, as references um, for her, the CEO and, and her company. Um, so that's helpful, um, but that's not always gonna be the case in, in this environment, um, especially when you, when you go as early as we do um, in terms of venture investing. So it, for us, this is gonna mean a lot more touch points, right? Where, whereas when you were able to go and have a drink or lunch or dinner with someone, you know, you could spend a couple of hours and um, see them in a different environment and um, tease out a lot of things about their personality and, and things like that. Um, now you're not able to do that. So I think what's going to happen is, you know, it's just a lot more phone calls or Zoom calls or what have you. Um, unfortunately, you're not going to get those kind of organic um, experiences that, you know, that we've come to rely on so much, um, but you have to, you know, you gotta work within the confines that you that um, that you have. Um, but I think the thing that that's going to it's gonna put more emphasis on um, it's gonna put more emphasis on the the actual company itself, the solution itself, um, you know, uh, the traction that they're seeing. Right, um, all of those things are going to become the fundamentals of, of the of the business, the unit economics. All those things um, are becoming more and more important because, um, you know, while we love to back like really great founders, um, and we still we still will look for that, um, it's going to be harder to to do that evaluation in this environment. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, do you think that deals? for you yourself will happen with a founder you don't have any refer- references for, you don't have any referrals, no past investors, no other touch points other than talking to them just as you're talking to me and they've got you know, minimal traction, but they're C, C stage and they've got a very compelling venture. Is, is that gonna happen? It, it could. Um, yeah, it's a what if, right? <laughs> um, like I said, never, never say never. Never if, say it's never. A, if it's a, if it's, if it's a company that's building in a space that, that we absolutely love and see a world of potential in, and, um, we also believe that they have something that's novel, um, either in approach or in solution itself, technology itself. Um, and then we look and we see that, okay, well, this team that they've put together is super qualified and capable of pulling this thing off. Then, then yeah, I, I think we'll, um, I could see us pulling, pulling the trigger on, on something like that. So I've got a very timely uh, question in chat and, I'm, yeah. and I'm, I'm able to swivel, you know, and I don't have to leave all the questions to the end, but you know, what type of traction is most interesting for you? Is that, you know, conceivably, you could have a product that has making no money, no revenue, but has a significant following, or you could have a product with no following that has, you know, an actual tangible product. I mean, what type of mix, what kind of traction is most compelling for you? So, you know, y'all are probably going to hate this answer, but it's a, it, it, it depends. Trying to get to the answer that we all would love to hear but <laughs> yeah, it, it it really it, it's really going to depend right so I'll, I'll give you some some examples um you know the last the last deal i did um closed was in march it was a company called store cash that's basically um a platform that allows 
the underbanked and unbanked to receive um, receive money on this platform, spend it in stores as if it was a gift card or something like that, and then also I pull the cash out of um, out of the platform. It doesn't require a debit debit card or a bank account. Um, so really a huge market, right? Um, there are many, 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 many um, people just in the United States alone that are in the unbanked and underbanked um, uh, communities for various reasons. Either, um, you know, for whatever reason, they cannot get a bank account or they don't trust uh, the, the banking system. Uh, so really huge problem, um, very unique solution to it. Um, they were fortunately starting to, to generate revenue, but the thing that, um, that got me excited about it was, you know, in a few months, we call it five months or so, they had over 200 um, vendors or stores on their platform. So, and, and it was growing, um, growing quickly, um, upwards of 30% month over month, right? So that was, that was interesting, right? Big problem unique solution, great founding team. And, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a trend line. I like trend lines um, of, of growth, right? So I guess a w one way to answer that question is um, show me the trend, right? Show me the thing that's most important to your business succeeding. Show me that that thing is growing at a significant clip month over month. I'm going to move on because I, I feel like we, yeah, I could ask you so many questions similarly, and it's going to be a lot of it depends. And, you know, I feel as if we've got a lot of, we've got a number of founders on, on the line as well uh, on, on this uh, webinar. And yeah. everybody's looking for, you know, a way in. You could mm -hmm. say when you don't have a significant amount of trash and everyone's challenged to find capital at this point. Um, so with that said, how are you find, how are you sourcing your, your opportunities and has that changed in, in recent time? Yeah, I'm going to answer that, but uh, just touching on something that you just mentioned, right? It's also about the finding the right um, investor for you and for the stage that you're in right now. Right, so, so there are a number of pre-seed funds out there. So like Precursor um, Ventures is, is one that, that sticks out to me, right? Um, <clears throat> Charles Hudson's a buddy of mine and they invest in, in, in companies that um, are very like close to the idea stage sometimes, right? So uh, he's gonna require less, less traction um, than, than I would at, at the seed stage. So it's about understanding where you are and, and what um, that investment firm likes to, likes to see or is comfortable with, right? Like, you know, put a, put a round peg into a round hole instead of, you know, round in a square. Gotcha. Um, and then, sorry, the, the actual question again. <laughs> no problem, no problem. Um, how are you sourcing your opportunities this time? Oh. Yeah, um, so the, the, best, the, the best companies that we've invested in have come from entrepreneurs that we've worked with in the past. Either it's their next company or it's a friend um, that they believe in that's building um, a, a great company. Those are usually the, the best references and um, the, the top conversations and, and top performing um, uh, companies that we've invested in by far. Um, um, second would be investors that we've invested with in the past um, that really understand what, what we look for in companies and how we like to work with them. Um, they'll, they they, they kind of have us figured out. They know us. And so they're able to send us some, you know, interesting things that come across their desk that either they are going to um, planning to be a part of and are looking for a firm like us that um, can provide, you know, different types of support than they can to, um, to the entrepreneur. Um, or it's a company that, that they really like, but is outside of, of, um, of where they can invest or, or want to invest today. Um, 
those are also great introductions. And then we get a lot of, um, I mean, our network is broad, so, so we get a lot of stuff from just other um, folks within, within our network, um, whether it be um, athletes or um, agencies, uh, both brand and, um, and, and representation agencies, or um, from, you know, Fortune 500 companies that um, meet, uh, meet startups that are looking to work with them. Um, that you know are a little bit, a little bit early and, and underfunded, um, and so they, um, you know, they they share those opportunities with us. And then, um, you know, one of the things that we we like to say at our firm is that um, talent is is ubiquitous, but opportunity is not. And so um, we have a, a a form on our website, and we get a lot of inbound from there. And we look at every single deal that comes in through there and try to get back to um, every entrepreneur that reaches out to us within 14 days. And sometimes it's, um, you know, hey, this is not a good fit for us right, at, right after the first read. Other times it's, um, you know, we have one, uh, one phone call and then find out it's not a good fit. Other times it gets deeper in the process. Um, and can you hear me okay i can hear you okay now the sound just uh went way off i hope everyone could uh hear what you what you were saying in the last couple of seconds um maybe it was just me uh, as far as uh the actual mechanics and I think this really will help the angel investors on the line <clears throat> how are the deals typically structured and what has changed uh, in the last this year last couple of months when you say structured um, say more terms and and well no <laughs> terms and uh, I mean I'm, I won't assume, but equity and, uh, you know, uh, convertible debt. I mean, there's many different high level structures or ways to put the deal. And just obviously you're not going to go very detailed into the terms, but how are you, how are you approaching in general deals with the founders? Yeah. So we, we, we try to lead the majority of the deals that we, um, that we're part of. Um, so we're actually, um, you know, drafting the, those those terms and, and term sheets. Um, although we are, you know, happy to participate in deals where another um, investor is leading and the terms make sense for us um, based on based on the company. Um, we are open to price rounds, um, convertible notes, and safes. Right. Um, if we do a safe, uh, we typically have a side letter that that goes along with it. Um, that you know, just ask for uh, simple things like uh, information rights, and and um, depending on our check size, you know, um, pro rata rights or the right to invest at a um, equal percentage in the next um, uh, qualified round of funding. Um, but we're it's okay. We're um, we're we're open to to all all three of those those forms and have done deals even out of our uh, most recent fund um you know in in each of those so it just depends on where the where the, where the company is i sometimes it, it it's not the right time for um, a company to be priced um like formally priced and so the safe and the convertible note are are a better way to go um or it's a matter of um timing so um you know, maybe maybe they want to get the get the round done really quickly with very little negotiation, um, and so in that case, a safe or convertible note makes more sense, and um, and we're fine with with doing either or any of those three. I, I've got a guest speaker. <laughs> right, say hello, and then say hi, and then go. Hey. Normally that works with my son, you know, you give him his uh, two seconds of fame and then uh, 
and then they uh, they they disappear. But also, my my daughter is a little bit more boisterous. She wants to she wants to take over. <laughs> um, okay, it's a new normal, right? Yeah, it's a it's a new normal, and they always seem to appear when I when I start talking on the phone. It's like they can they can just feel that Daddy's engaged. And therefore, I I must get part of the action. Um, <clears throat> um, so as far as has there been any significant changes in, in the clauses made um, this since uh, since the um, in the last couple of months as far as uh, terms beneficial for the no for the for the investor no I, I haven't seen it and um, we we definitely haven't changed any any of the terms and you know in the term sheets that that we've written the only you know where I think uh, in that change is just the sh a shift in um, uh, where the companies are are valued, right? Um, I think just given given the environment, there's going to be there's going to be less investors um, deploying capital, um, which means there's there's less competition for the deal, um, which is going to depress the, uh, the the valuation. Um, also, you know, just thinking thinking ahead. Uh, no one knows what's, what's going to happen. And the last thing you want to do is, is price a company um, so high that, you know, they get into trouble when they're, when they're trying to raise that next round of funding and get into down rounds or um, investors, you know, not, not being willing to, um, uh, you know, to invest in their company. So those are the considerations. So one quick question before I, I run and uh, hand off my daughter. Um, board seats, so those, uh, how should uh, angels think about, or investors think about board seats? <laughs> yeah, um, she's not happy. Um, so yeah, I, um, the entrepreneurs typically don't award board seats to, um, to, to angel investors. Um, although there's a, there are exceptions to everything, right? So if, if you are an angel investor that um, is poised to add all kinds of value to that um, to that company, uh, then it then it may make sense um, to um, to award a board seat. But you know if it's um, if it's a very early company and um, there there aren't institutional dollars in yet, there probably isn't a formal board outside of the um, outside of the, the founders um, that that has been created. And then once an institutional investor comes in, um, they're likely going to take that, um, that investor board seat. And typically the structure is um, a three person board, uh, which is one is an investor, <clears throat> uh, the lead investor of that round most, most likely, um, the CEO, founder of, of the company, and either another founder or an independent um, director. So um, angels, Typically or not, um, they, they, I do see angels sometimes as advisors to the board or board observers, but not, um, not directors typically. Okay. We, and we do take board seats when we lead deals. So sounds like, uh, no surprise, you're a very ethical investor, like not taking advantage of these times and, and founders. And I, I mean, I've heard, quite a bit, you know, term sheets being pulled, clauses changing, I and mean, what's generally been happening um, to, to founders of late? Yeah, fortunately, I have, we, none of our, um, our companies have experienced that. We have, you know, three companies that are um, closing um, next round of funding, um, you know, last week and um, probably into the next two weeks. And the terms haven't um, haven't changed. No one's pulled them. I think if you're if you're a smart investor and you plan to be in this business for a long time, you don't do stuff like that uh, because people are going to remember. We're not going to be in this environment for you know um, forever. And then also you know who who knows you know what that entrepreneur ends up doing. This company might end up being a dud, and their next one might be Google. Uh, and guess who's not going to have a chance to participate? Um, you know, in that, in that next company, if you, if you do things like that, I think you got to stick by your word. If you, if you, um, issued a term sheet, um, assuming you still have the capital to, um, 
to go forward with that investment, um, then then you should you know you should follow through with that. I I I can't understand, um, and I think it would be incumbent on the in the investor to, to communicate this if it's the case. But if you are dependent on on your limited partners or your investors as a VC um, in order to make um, you know. Uh, or to, to fulfill commitments that you've made to entrepreneurs and your investors aren't, aren't pulling their weight, well, then there is no money to, um, uh, <laughs> to, to deploy. And that's probably the only good reason um, not to follow through on a, on a commitment that, you, that you've made. Um, but yeah, typically that, that doesn't happen if you have institutional um, investors as, as part of your LP base. Yeah. I mean, as, as an organization, executive director of Black Angels Miami. I think that's one of the very important things for me and the organization is that when our members do invest, that it's a good relationship for the founders as well. And most likely, just as you said, we're going to be, we're going to be investing alongside other institutional entities, such as yourself. So, you know, we want, you know, if we had a bad dealing with you, you're probably not going to come back to us. Or if the founder doesn't like us, it's, it's going to spread. So, you know, membership wise, we want, to, we, we want Black Angels Miami to be synonymous with, you know, great experience, smart investors, um, just all in all a great um, uh, experience for everyone involved with us. So, you know, when the Google does come back around, <laughs> you know, we're part of the conversation. They want to, they come to us for money. So, yeah, I, I, I don't understand why, you know, some investors out there are, are taking advantage of people because we're not going to stay, as you said, in this state forever. Mm -hmm. It's just sort, it's just um, short sighted, um, <laughs> essentially. And you make a, a really good point that um, I, I probably should have mentioned is that the investors that are that are in the deal they're going to remember this this too that you fucked my my portfolio up. <laughs> right <laughs> so uh, there's no way you're getting invited uh, to another another deal that that we do and by the way um you know if entrepreneurs uh come and ask well we're going to be honest yeah yeah so what is the so when, once you have made an investment, what's the typical time horizon to an exit and what are your typical modes of exit from uh, deals? I think industry wide, it's, it's seven to 10 years. It used to be more like um, five to seven, um, but, but now we're seeing, you know, companies stay private longer or take longer to, to get acquired. Um, you know, we've had, we had a couple of kind of base hits that were about a year. Um, those are typically not great exits if the company's out in, the, in a year. So we got our money back essentially. Um, but then we had a, a sizable exit, which was um, close to a Forex. And that was about um, a three year old um, investment. Um, so it, it's kind of nice when, when those happen, although we prefer, you know, I'd wait a couple more years to get a 10X versus the, the 4X. And, and what is your typical um, investment in companies? What's, what's the range? Yeah, half a million to 1.5, um, targeting about 10% um, um, on a fully diluted basis. Okay. And is there a secondary market um, for um, equity in these startups which, which have not you know, got to next it yet? Yeah. I get emails every day. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and that, you know that's a, that's a tricky thing, right? Um, because you know, let's say you invested in a company and the valuation at time of investment was um, eight million, right? And and now that company is valued at um, five hundred million, right? Um, and it's it's five years later. Right. You, you may want to take a look at um, selling some of those shares. If you think it's going to go all the way to a multi-billion dollar um, opportunity, you probably don't want to sell all your shares. But, um, you know, providing some liquidity and returning some capital to, um, to your investors is, is, is never a, a bad thing. 
Um, but no one wants to, um, to hear that you got us out at, at 500 um, million and the thing is now 20 billion. Um, that's not, <laughs> that's not <laughs> so. so you said you get emails every day. Is this market, you know, is it who's in the know or is it an actual market? How, how would an angel investor navigate that if they've, they've made an investment it's going well and you know that the years in and they're considering you know some partial exit or full exit yeah they're, they're companies that specialize in um in secondaries okay um, you can you know look those up and reach out to them and um let them know that you're you're interested in, in selling the other thing is you can just go um, to the company itself and say, hey, I, I need some liquidity. Um, I want to I want to sell, you know, X percentage of my of my shares. Um, usually, you know, the companies have um, uh, the right of first refusal. So, you know, um, you know, them and the existing investors would would have the first um, opportunity Well, the existing investors and then the company would have the um, uh, the initial opportunity to buy those shares. And then um, if not, you know, you can, you can take it elsewhere. The other way it works too, is you go to one of these secondaries and you tell them you want to sell your shares and you get an offer um, for it. And then you have to share that offer with the existing investor, the other investors and, and the company. And then um, they'll either match that offer or allow you to, to, to sell um, to, you know, whoever was going to buy it. How often is this happening? All the time. All the time. There literally, there are companies that <laughs> were created. I, I think it was it might have been like ten years ago where they they became really really popular. Um, the, you know, companies that focus like one hundred percent on on sec on the secondary market. Okay. So angel investors shouldn't be too concerned with a, a good investment and a time horizon of you know seven ten years. There, there are opportunities if things are going well to actually. Uh, exit if they if they wanted to you can um most of the time you'll be leaving a lot of money on the table though yeah. uh, you want to think about that you know I, with every like with every any asset class you want to invest what you can afford um to to invest right so money that you won't you won't necessarily need for those seven to ten years right, right. that's that's the idea um if you're you know if you're investing and it's going to um, affect your ability to, to pay your mortgages or, or whatever other obligations you might have, then um, probably not a good idea. <clears throat> so I'm not a financial advisor, by the way. <laughs> you're not on the record for anything you say. <laughs> you're just being recorded and live streamed across the world. <laughs> um, follow on rounds. Um, yeah. Do you have a special allocation or a limit to invest in those rounds? And how should angels think about those rounds? Because ideally they do come up because you've made a great investment and that entity needs more capital. Yeah. So some investors get um, what, is, what is called pro rata rights, which, are, which is basically the ability to invest um at your same keep basically invest in the next round of, of funding to keep your equity where it is um within the company so if you own 10 percent um whatever that number is in this next round it allows you to keep 10 percent. you have the right to do that now not not every investor is going to necessarily have that right um and it becomes it becomes tricky and and even dicey with um you know, very valuable and coveted companies, right? Um, because, you know, a new investor is going to want a, want to deploy a certain check size um, with a certain um, ownership stake in mind. And then um, after that, you have, um, you know, whatever, whatever is left in, in the round, right? So let's say it's a $5 million round, a new investor wants to do um, 3 million of it. So now you've got 2 million, 2 million left that needs to be split up amongst the, um, the existing investors. And, um, you know, you typically do it by, by ownership, ownership stake. 
but um, you know, if there's only if there's only two million or even a million left, um, you might not get enough to keep your um, your ownership where it was, and so then that becomes a a, a negotiation, um, and and sometimes um, it gets to a point where, you know, the entrepreneur, the the, um, the 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 owners of the company, will ask investors to um, even step down their um, their pro rata their investment amount or not participate um, in, in a particular round. Um, so because of those types of situations, you see um, pro rata rights um, given out selectively. So how strongly, well, I'm assuming everybody wants them. Well, those that are savvy want them. How strongly <laughs> How strongly should angels be fighting for those rights and, and are angels at a um, disadvantage to get them? It'll be tough. Um, if you're, you know, if you're not an institutional investor, if you're early enough, if you're, if you're early as an angel, um, you can probably get it. You know, if you're a lot of um, convertible notes and, um, and safe notes, it's, it's built in for at least the next round. Right. Um, and so, you would get it as a, as a part of that. Beyond that, it, it starts becoming a bit more um, selective, and you just got to fight for it. I, you know, if if you're able to add outsized value to um, to that company, um, they're going to be inclined to to um, to reward you, right? Because they want to keep you around and keep you engaged and active and, and all those things. So think about that too. Now, is this a um... Is this a battle between the founders of the company and the investors? Or at some point, does it become also investors um, pushing who gets those rights, who doesn't get those rights across the investment pool? So I, could, I can imagine, I'm, I'm an investor. There's another round. There's someone coming in. They want certain rights. Maybe I don't want them to get those rights. Yeah. It's, hey, does that does that happen? It's it's usually um, based on um, investment thresholds, right? So you could say a certain group of rights are only um, uh, are, are designated for investors that invest a certain amount, and that's one to try. I'm going to mute you real quick to see if uh, everyone can hear me. Mike, can you hear me now? I can hear you. All right. For about five seconds there, I couldn't hear anything. So oh. the, the last, very last thing you said uh, got lost if you... Yeah. So I, I was saying that um, usually what, what happens is um, these rights will be um, designated to investors that invest above a certain um, dollar amount. So, you know, investors that, for instance, come into a round that uh, invest at least a million dollars would might get major investor rights, which includes information, um, um, pro rata and, and other other things, right of first refusal, other things like that. And if you're an investor that comes in below that, that, um, that, that threshold, uh, you wouldn't um, be granted those things. But um, there can be exceptions made, right? So this is when um, your relationship with the, with the CEO and the founding team and the um, value that you've added um, you know, over time comes into play uh, because they can advocate that, yeah, while the, the threshold is a million, um, you know, uh, this group is putting in half a million, but they're so important to us that we want to make sure that they get these rights. And, and those are awarded um, usually in, in some kind of side letter or management um, <clears throat> management rights letter. Um, and that said, you know, entrepreneurs and lawyers like to tell entrepreneurs they want to keep things clean, not have a lot of side letters and things like that. Um, so it's another thing that you know, kind of you're you're up against. Okay. Um, <clears throat> coming up on five, um, and. We've got a number of questions in Q&A, which I do want to get to. Um, first, uh, one more question from me. Um, 
for the angels that you invest alongside, or should I say the angels invest alongside you, is it typical that they're coming in as a group, say from an angel group like uh, BAM? Not necessarily. Um, I've seen, you know, individual um, angel investors, and usually these are um, people that have built companies in a specific space. And, you know, here's, here's a company that they're investing in that's in that space that's doing something that's, um, <clears throat> that's novel or that has been missing um, for, for a long time. Um, I, I see, see those all the time. I also see angel groups that um, invest in funds. We have a, we have a couple um, that, ha that are LPs in our fund um, and get exposure to, to the deals that, that we invest in through the fund. Um, and then, you know, also uh, angel groups that are, are investing directly into, um, into, into companies and, you know, and alongside other um, institutional or traditional investors. So, yeah, I mean, this has been great. I, I, there are so many questions, as I said at the very beginning, before too many people did get on and, and I did introduce them. I had so many questions for Marlon and I whittled it down to like 25% and I think we've gone through half of those. Um, but there are so many, so many small nuances that, you know, someone who's experienced would, you know, not necessarily take for granted, but someone who's new to angel investing or someone who's been an angel investor may not know because they don't have that infrastructure around them or that amount of deal flow to have that experience. So you, experience is experience you have to have gone through it to a certain extent and the great thing you know we're trying to accomplish with BAM is to bring we've got established angel investors and and bring on new angel investors so an so a new investor doesn't feel like they're alone trying to figure this all out as well as having a relationship with, with Mac Ventures and others with potential opportunities to invest um, <clears throat> a, a follow-up call to this um, for anybody that is interested, um, as, as Marlon said, um, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from Marlon in, in detail about his fund. Anybody that's interested in potentially uh, in, in investing in, in Mac Ventures or joining as an as a LP, um, get out that opportunity. And there's going to be a survey at the end when you close out of this. Um, where you can put in your email and uh, we'll, we'll follow up with an invite for that talk. And I'll also send an email uh, to everyone after, after uh, this webinar. So um, I wanna make sure we get to questions because you know what happens with questions, questions turn into more questions. So I wanna make sure uh, we get through a good number of these. Um, and I'm getting questions on, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know if everybody can see the questions on, on the webinar, but I'm getting questions. I've got like a dozen questions through my phone, which is uh, <laughs> interesting. So let's start with, um, I think we, we already asked the first question. So what type of trash is most interesting? Um, do you discount a single founder company? No. Um you know, you, you don't have to designate someone else as a, as a co-founder in order for it to be interesting. Um, but teams are, are important because, you know, one of the things you're looking for in, you know, in a high quality CEO is the ability to um, motivate others and inspire others to come along on, on the journey and to be able to sell. If you can't sell to, um, you know, to people that will work with you, you're probably not going to be able to sell successfully to your customers. And so that, so that's a flag. So yeah, you need to, you need to have a team. Um, your team doesn't have to be uh, designated as, as, as co-founders. Okay. That's a, that's a good distinction there. Um, <clears throat> are there particular verticals and industries um, that have come out of COVID-19 and established themselves a new normal, which you're excited about, where the acceleration of or digital adoption is going to have a lasting effect and you're looking for opportunities to get in? Is there any particular space which uh, has you excited or interested in? 
Yeah, I mean, health tech is a space that fortunately we started investing in like four years ago. Um, and so uh, literally all of our um, health tech companies are doing extremely well right now. I think the, the rest of the kind of investment community is, is kind of waking, waking up to that, that the fact that um, our, in the US at least, our, our healthcare system is, is pretty broken. Um, and there, there are opportunities for technology that, to come in and help to, one, drive down costs, and two, drive up efficacy and quality of care. And so we've, we've been focusing on um, technology platforms that can do um, those three things um, for a while now. And, and I think that's something that's, that's definitely here to stay. Next question from an anonymous attendee. Um, what types of due diligence or information do you look for in a potential startup? And I'm, I'm sure it goes very deep, but what initially should they be thinking about finishing to you? Beyond yeah. an executive summary. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, um, you know, really large, like huge um, market opportunities. So I want to understand that, you know, you're, you're, you're solving something that's deemed as a real problem for a great many people. And, um, and that, that can translate to, to um, very big dollars. Uh, then I also wanna know uh, what are you doing that's different to, um, to, to tackle this, this problem? Um, what is it that's novel and exciting and defensible about um, this product or your approach? Uh, and then you know, who else is doing this? How do you stand out? You know, how do you maintain that, um, that difference? Um, it's, it's in other words, put another way, moat, right? So what, what's your moat and how, how wide and how deep it, is it? What's in it? You got crocodiles and, you know, barbed wire or what, what's, what's in your moat? <laughs> and then, um, you know, and then you, right? So um, why, should we, why should we believe in you and, and back you, right? Are you that entrepreneur that's going to run through walls to make sure this happened, but still have a... Um, still balance that with an ability to listen to advice that you're getting from, from all around you and especially what the marketplace is, is, um, is saying to you. So how do you quantify a large opportunity? Does it have to be national? Does it have to be international? Does it have to have a potential revenue target? Um, how, how do you quantify that? Because I get a lot of people talking about opportunities that are possibly regional um could be relegated to one city maybe a great business but won't reach you know the type of opportunity you're probably looking for but what is what is that threshold for you yeah i i think those kind of um regional or um you know solo location specific businesses can be great, great businesses, but they probably don't warrant um, venture financing. Um, you know, I, the, the companies that warrant venture financing have the opportunity to, to become multi-billion dollar organizations in, in value. Um, and so in order for, you know, a, a company to become that, um, you know, you have to be looking at uh, a market that's um, multiples um, bigger in size. Right. And, and you also want to make sure that the company that, that we're thinking about investing doesn't have to take like 30 to 50 percent of the market in order to, to become that billion dollar um, um, company. So th that's what I'd be looking at. And then for, for the entrepreneurs, um, you know, don't don't rush to, to, to get venture financing if you don't need it. I, I always say I think there, there are only two reasons why an entrepreneur should raise venture financing. Um, one, you absolutely need um, the capital to create the product, right? So, uh, and advance the product. Uh, you you got to hire engineers and things like that. And there's, there's no other way for you to um, effectively uh, get the capital you need to do that. Or two, um, 
you're at a point where you really need to scale the thing that you've built and you have to do it rapidly, right? So you can't, you can't wait for the profits of the business um, to put back in and scale up that way. You need, um, you need financing in order to do it. Those are the literally the only two reasons why I think um, uh, uh, founders uh, should, should raise venture capital financing. And if either of those things are true, you're probably, you probably don't need to be a venture backed company. And you're probably not a venture backable company. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned board seats. Well, we talked about board seats, and you mentioned free board seats. Um, outside of a lead investor or founder, any recommendation on the type of individual a founder should have on their board to form one? Yeah, um, someone that can help. <laughs> to, to put it to put it simply right uh and, and that could mean that you know if they're an investor they've invested in directly in your space or in uh in, in a tangential space right um that they really understand um you know how to help you drive this thing this thing forward if they're not an investor and they're they're an advisor then you know they have a certain level of domain expertise that they can lend or credibility that they can um, lend to your company by being um, affiliated. Um, or, you know, they can help you drive sales in a very, very meaningful way. Um, the, typically that's, that's, that's what I would be looking for and people that you trust, right? Mm -hmm. Now, should investors be sprinting to become board members? Should it be something which they, I mean, being a board member is not just, you know, a title. I mean, there's actual <laughs> responsibilities there. Is it something investors should, should covet, should, should be going for? I think if it makes sense, right? Um, like if, if you are in position, if, if you are the best person to, to, to help drive this thing forward, then sure. Um, but the other thing to remember is that, you know, um, with this responsibility comes risk, right? Board members vote on things and, and sometimes that can be a liability. Uh, so do you, do you, do you, do you want to accept that, that, that liability just to say you're a board member? Um, can you, can you go, I mean, I, I understand, but can you, um, go into a little bit more of the liability of being a board member for, for those uh, potential investors we have online? I mean, you're voting on operations plans. You're voting on, um, you know, issuing, issuing uh, additional stock. You're voting on, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, reductions, like in the environment that we're in right now, um, you know, changing the operating plan and um you know reducing headcount and 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 all these things right sometimes employees get pissed off and they sue <laughs> we have insurance to, to cover that stuff but still it's a liability now is that insurance uh for you uh, for your <laughs> fund or what insurance would an angel investor have or should they have an insurance should they have insurance if they're on a board yes and um, it's typically paid for by the company um, for, for each, and it covers each director. Okay. <clears throat> a question from David Mahan. Would you invest in a company whose founder and majority of team are still in college? And let me add to that. Um, I know, you know, they've got to be past the concept stage, but let's say they have traction, let's say, Let's say they, they, they reached those um, thresholds you mentioned earlier, but they're in college. I think it depends. Uh, <laughs> like one, like, you know, um, at some point, if someone's got to run this thing full time in order for it to, to, to scale, right? Um, if you're not ready to do that, then it's probably not the right point for us to, in, to invest. You know, if you are, I don't know, six, three to six months away from graduating or planning to leave school at a certain um, uh, milestone, 
um, then yeah, then possibly. But can't be a freshman planning to <laughs> do do all four years of, of, of college and, and get funding and try to run a high growth company at the same time. That is impossible. <clears throat> yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, interesting question from Emmanuel. Would you recommend the secondary market route as a starting point for inexperienced managers or company launching a new fund? So, uh, so do, do I recommend you start a secondary, um, a, a secondaries like? No. Yeah, a fund, so it sounds like a fund based on investing via secondary markets or via, you know, secondary offerings. Um, if that's what if that's what you plan to, to be when you grow up, right? Um, if you are um, trying to, to get into early stage investing and you have a track record of um, doing secondaries, you haven't exactly proven that you can be good at early stage investing. So it, they're, they're, they're two different two different things. Now, if, if you plan to grow up to be a, a great late stage investor um then maybe doing those secondaries is you know is a good thing because you're getting into companies that you know later in their um life cycle and you're showing that you know you can pick them and they at that stage and, and they continue to appreciate um i i just think it, it you're, you're building a track record and that's what um that's what institutional investors are looking looking for they they want to see if pick good companies at the stage where you're planning to invest in um, that you can get the allocation that you're um, that you're saying that you know that you're going to go after um, <clears throat> and uh, and that you can you can run this vehicle uh, successfully okay uh, next question from Alex Hancock can you describe your valuation methodologies <laughs> Or how do I, yeah, I, I mean, we could have another call on how to evaluate a company. It just, but, you know, just, just very high level for Alex. Like, I, I'm, I could probably answer this question, but I'll let you. <laughs> there, there are a lot of different ways to, to value companies. I mean, you can do revenue multiples. Usually at the early stage, it's, um, it's more, art than it is science it's you're, you're looking at what similar companies had been had been valued at where is this company um in relation to that to to, to those companies in terms of um technology stack um traction the founding team etc and you can go up or you can go down um but you know and the market is gonna is gonna help you if it's a you know it's a really high quality deal and a lot of people interested that one's going to be a little bit more expensive um than than one that is um you know less hot okay next question from baron channa how should investors view or place angel investing versus stocks in their portfolio I guess that's an in question, uh, interesting question at this time with the market as it is. Yeah. I mean, do you feel like you look at the market some days and feel like, oh, I wish I could just shift all my money or you're happy in the lane you're in? I mean, how, how, would it, how should an angel investor view the two? Well, I, I, I think it's, again, I'm not a financial advisor. <laughs> <laughs> I certify that, I back that up. Martin is not a financial advisor. Yeah, um, there are two things, right? One is going to be way more volatile, um, and and that's the, and that's the stock market, um, and particularly, you know, in times like this, right? When you when you're investing in private companies, it's a uh, it's a long term investment, and it's probably it's going to be a bit more stable um, over over time. So in an environment like this, if, you know, if I was looking at stocks versus um, angel investing, unless I was a day trader, 
I would I would go with investing in in, in private companies because it's like playing Monopoly. You know, when you um when 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 all the properties on the board are um, are bought up and there are hotels everywhere, um, you want to go to jail and hang out. <laughs> <laughs> right so so this is this is kind of like your way of um you know parking your money somewhere where you believe it will appreciate significantly but over a longer period of time now with that said i mean being an investor is not there, there's there is risk in that you know you're putting your money behind a, a private company and that company has to do well and you are picking them and not every venture is going to succeed with the, that billion dollar evaluation. So how, how, how many deals should, an, or is there a number, angel invest, an angel investor should be trying to do um, over, you know, to put in their portfolio? Because you probably don't want to have just one company. <laughs> probably don't want to have it. Probably don't want to do that. Yeah, I, and that's, that's why I think it's a great idea for angel investors to participate in venture funds, right? Because like we're going to invest in 30 to 40 companies um, over the life of our current fund, right? Our last fund, we invested in about 42 companies, right? Um, and some are gonna do amazingly well, some are gonna do pretty well, some are gonna do okay, and some are gonna tank, right? And, um, and you'll benefit from you know, the, the first, the first three in the first three sets in, in, in the portfolio. Um, so I'd advocate for that. Um, but it's also self-serving, right? Cause I run a venture fund. Um, the, I, I can't tell, I'm not in position to tell, um, an angel investor how many companies they should have in their portfolio. What I will say is that if you're going to invest alone, um, make sure you're investing in something that you understand. So you may not you may not necessarily understand how the technology of a you know specific tech company works, but you understand the market. You understand what what the key drivers for success in that space and that company would be. So I, I'd say you want to you want to do that. And the other thing is you want to invest alongside smart investors, right? So that could be another angel investor that has a, a good amount of experience. Um, investing in in early stage tech companies and and you're you know you're um, not necessarily following them along but you are taking guidance from them or there's a venture firm that you are close with and um, you know you're investing alongside that that firm and taking advantage of their um, the diligence that that they do etc. You wouldn't want to join an organization like that. Okay. <laughs> So on the topic of support and portfolios, what kind of support are you providing to your portfolio companies right now? And are there any unique hiring opportunities? This question from Wendy Francois. Um, yeah, so we are, we, we, we did a lot like in this environment. So when it, when it first hit, um, I wrote, I, this really long letter with all these uh, these points of guidance to all of our um, CEOs, and said, "Here's here here's some best practices for navigating um, downturns, right?" Um, and 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 then I then I published it um, on on Medium if anyone's interested in reading that. Um, and then it was um, connecting with every single one of our CEOs. And understanding um, where they were, um, what's their cash position, what's their burn, how much runway do you have? Um, is your business one that we think is going to thrive in this environment, or is it one that we think is not going to do any business in this environment, and therefore you need to just conserve your capital and continue to build so that when we come out of this, you can um, you're in a, a, a really uh, strong striking position. And, and then it was, you know, playing counselor um, and almost psychiatrist to help them understand that you're not in bucket A, you're in bucket B or you're in bucket C. And, you know, let's, let's come to grips with that and let's start to, let's put in place a plan that is actually appropriate for, um, for your business during this time. Um, 
And now, you know, it's um, the, the, the conversations are, are more and more spaced out um, as, as time passes and, and um, folks accepted where they are and have implemented plans. And, and now it's just like, okay, well, how are things? How are things going? Are you seeing any changes, et cetera? Um, that's what we're doing. And then the ones that are, that are doing really, really well, um, it, it's still striking a balance, right? You're doing well right now, but in three months, are you, you know, do we think you're still going to be doing as well as you are right now? Um, so let's still be conservative in, um, in our hiring, in our hiring plan um, and our spending, um, spending plan just to make sure that if things do take a, a shift for in a negative direction, um, we can control, we can control our own destiny still. So that's what we're doing. Um, and then the, the second part of the question, are there any hiring opportunities? We're, our firm is not hiring right now. Um, we do have some portfolio companies that, um, that are hiring, um, ready responders and, and the health tech space, they're hiring. Um, Play versus in the um, esports space, they are they are hiring. Um, who else? Um, Pipe, which is in uh, SaaS um, enterprise SaaS space, they are they are hiring. Um, Do you um, list uh, these opportunities on your website for your portfolio yeah, companies? Or? Yeah, on there's a jobs page on on our website, and um, usually we have them covered there. Okay, great. So. Do you think, and this is from Brown Chandler, do you think investors like you and maybe Black Angels have a role or even responsibility to help fund Black and Brown innovators? Say that again, sorry. Do, do we, oh, do we have a responsibility to, um, to Black folks? <laughs> um, yeah, I think so, right? Um, I, I think it, it first starts with being visible uh, so that you know, the people that are gonna come after us um, have ex have examples and know that it's it's a possibility. So I, I think that's one thing. Um, earlier in the call, I, I I mentioned that you know we believe that you know uh, potential and talent ubiquitous, um, but um, you know opportunity and funding is not. And so that's one of the reasons why you know we we look at companies that come to us um, you know through over the internet or just um, reach out blindly, right? Because not everyone is plugged into, the net, into our network. And um, we don't wanna miss a great opportunity um, just because you know, um, Kevin doesn't know, you know someone that, that is close to me that I, that I, that I respect, right? Um, you know, we even wrote a, um, a report called um, um, Culture as Currency which speaks to the fact that um, more black and brown people are becoming educated in, in, the, in the tech space and are tackling problems relevant to their communities that have not been um, addressed uh, in ever. <laughs> and um, which represent um, in some cases, multi-billion dollar opportunities. And so, you know, I, I definitely wanna hear um, from people that are that are solving those those solutions and that are creating new markets, right? It's it's um, it's just stupid not to. And if we don't do it, who's who's going to do it? That's very true. That's true. Last of the questions on Q and A, and if you got any more, you got another minute to put it in. Um, and this is something probably took for granted at the very beginning or throughout the call is just to highlight what the difference is between seed, series A, and pre-seed. And I know your sweet spot is seed, but what are, what's the difference between those different uh, stages of fundraising or investing? Yeah, sorry, I muted for a second. There's an ice cream truck driving by. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, uh, pre-seed is, is, is typically, um, and by the way, these are gonna vary from investor to investor. Everyone has, has adopted their own definition of these. So this is my definition. Um, so pre-seed is, you know, you, 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 you have a little bit more than an idea, right? You probably have a team and you are, you're building to a viable product, right? Mm -hmm. Seed is um, you've, you've built that viable product and you're starting to get feedback 
in some way from um, your, your respective um, customer base. Um, and in Series A, you've, you've done everything in, in pre-seed and, um, and, and seed, and now um, you've demonstrated that um, you're at the early stage of scaling the, the platform. Makes sense to me. Um, so I believe we've gone through the questions. Um, I really appreciate Marlon, you taking the time to uh, spend with us a day to talk to everyone about investing. I think it's a, this is a unique time for all of us in many ways. And especially if you are an investor or a founder or someone who's looking to become an investor, um, there's a, many opportunities um, with a multitude of challenges, but opportunities nonetheless. Um, so thank you. And this was the first in a series of talks we're going to be doing for Black Angels Miami. Um, and we are really a, a we're a membership based um, investment club for angels. So as Marlon said, you, you know, going alone is a, uh, is a challenge. And, you know, we've got experienced angels. We're, we're we're going to be talking to Marlon and other funds. So there's going to be opportunities if you if you are interested in going in that direction. Uh, but my goal is to have many webinars of compelling content and um, value for angels and founders alike. Um, so thank you all for joining. Uh, at the end of this, there will be a uh, questionnaire. Would love your feedback. And if you would like any more information on BAM, you can meet at our website is blackangels.miami and our Twitter is blackangelsmiami. And, and Marlon, how can anyone learn more about uh, yourself, your fund? Yeah, um, so our website is macmacventurecapital.com. Um, our you know, Twitter and IG handles are macventurecap and mine is Marlon C. Nichols, um, Twitter and, um, and, and IG. And on LinkedIn, it's just Marlon Christopher Nichols. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, this, was, this was fun. Hopefully it was um, somewhat useful for, for the guests. Um, yeah, looking forward to doing it again sometime. All right, great. Thank you all, we'll definitely do this again. And uh, yeah, my name is Kevin Cadet. I was not on the uh, meeting invite, but thank you for bearing with me, sharing this time. And um, hope to uh, meet with you all soon. And more information about the Mac Venture Capital Fund, um, please, on the survey, put in your email. We'll be probably scheduling that meeting very shortly. Uh, thank you all. And until the next webinar, everyone stay safe and healthy. All right, bye-bye.